Queridos irmãos, chegamos. Dear brothers and sisters, we got to one more tutorial now this new series of the series God calls us into his own kingdom and glory. This is the daily food, the power of the gospel. This is tutorial of week three, whose title is a, a bird's eye view. Very good. And the title says that it is always important when you study a, a book to have a bird's eye view, just like an eagle can see from above, can have a more broadened view, which get situated, and we need, as I always like to do, to have a contextualization of each book, and then the book begins to have life. Otherwise, it will be just a study. And we don't want to do a doctrinal study, but we really want to understand the burden of the Word of God when read, written by the Apostle Paul. This bird's eye view is for us to understand at the time what happened with the church in Thessalonica, what happened to them, very good. So in the book of Acts, chapter 17, in the first verses we see that Paul, after in Philippi, after Philippi in the region in Macedonia, he went to Thessalonica and he discussed for three Sabbaths. Let us read Acts chapter 17. For three Sabbaths, Paul reasoned with them, presenting the gospel to the saints in Thessalonica. So he, as always, went to a synagogue of the Jews. Because that was a better place to present. Because there they studied the word of God. And where those who were worried with understanding and studying the word of God. On verse 2. And... Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them for the, from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. So Paul got to Thessalonica at least for three Sabbaths, not necessarily. Paul remained only this time. It may be that he remained more longer, but... In the record in Acts 17, at least for three Sabbaths, Paul remained there, and there Paul preached Christ, that Christ was necessary, had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And then he wrote to the Thessalonians in the two letters, Certainly, Paul said that this Christ then, he was raised by God the Father, and he will come back to take possession of his kingdom as king. So this sounds kind of worrisome. This raises a political worrisome, because Thessalonica, as well, this whole region, was under the the dominion of the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire had, was very uh, concerned about any kind of uproar and sedition, uh, and for for any uh, revolt, uprising, 
And to speak of Jesus who died and will rise again, this is for the politicians, this brings uh, concern to them. So, next on verse 4, we read, And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. This is quite important because in Thessalonica, some Jews were saved. Turn to Jesus, and here we read uh, that a great multitude of devout Greeks and not a few of the living women from high society, noble women like the church in Berea, this happened the same thing. So there was raised a church with a great possibility of advancing. That is why Paul had a special appreciation for this church. It was a church with some Jews, usually these few Jews who were saved. They became good partners and co-workers of Paul. And they gave all the protection and let us, let us say all the logistics for Paul to carry on the gospel, the work of the gospel forward. And many Greeks, speaking of many women, also uh, leading women. So it, mean, it means that the, the gospel reached the Greeks of high society in the region who had a church with a, some uh, Jews, devout Greeks and women, leading women, well, that is, they had human resources, and also they had financial resources. It is a church that had everything to succeed, was very promising. We have to understand this background. And right after that, the Jews moved with envy. The Jews who were not persuaded becoming envious took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in there in uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So the Jews, uh, Silas and Timothy, preaching for three Sabbaths and was able to get many people who followed them. This brought a lot of envy to the Jews and they made an uproar and set all the city in uproar and attacked the house of Jason, who hosted Paul. He was also a Jew. And so much the multitude and the authorities were troubled, say that they saying that these are acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there's another king, Jesus. So, like I said in the beginning, this brought a political problem to the situation. This is a background in Acts 17. So, now let us get to First Thessalonians chapter 1. There we see in the beginning Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, right in the first chapter, chapter 1, verse 1. But to enter the situation, first I'd like to give you better context. Besides the, the Jews who had much problem as for believing in Jesus at that time and turning to Jesus, this was something amazing. This was contrary to Judaism against the Jewish religion. So then they immediately were isolated from society. Maybe who knows, even isolated from their family. They would have had difficulties, for example, of uh, getting a job, of re having a relationship and so on with the Jews. But it was no different. Also, this was no different to the Greeks, because the Greeks were polytheists. You know that the Greeks believed in many gods. From Greek mythology, 
and they believed that there were many gods and each of those gods had a certain function, playing a certain role, and if they needed any favor in those areas that in any of those gods had its influence, its scope of work, so they would sacrifice to those idols, to those gods, each one with their own temple, and thus they received favors. Meaning what? That the many gods actually had man as a center, and man is always selfish. He actually wants, by the greed, greedy, by the love of money, this is a fuel to all things. So they went after the gods, actually, after all, to become wealthy, to be healed from diseases, to favor them. Several personal subjects for their family, uh, wedding, uh, agricultural, and agriculture. So gods were for them. They did not have a concept of one God who created the universe. Uh, one God out of whom it depends the whole creation. So this is a totally new concept for the Greeks. For the Greeks, this gospel that Paul brought was totally new to them. It's a new concept. They could not receive it. And the Greeks who received this gospel and were saved, turned to this true God, would certainly also be isolated from society, not to say to be isolated from their families and would have difficulties also in a professional context, in the business context. So that is, they pay the high price to be saved, turned to the Lord Jesus. Not to mention the political side that this Jesus would be the king that in his second coming would come to take his kingdom. This was a serious problem for the Roman Empire. So with that, they had a very strong turning to, the, to God. That is why in chapter 1, on verse 2, we, say, we read, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, the work of faith, in the original Greek, the work of their faith when they believed in Jesus, this faith worked greatly and powerfully in their lives to the point of them leaving all abandoning all idolatry, which which was actually to favor man, to bring benefit to man. They left everything to serve the true and living God. This is on verse nine. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That is, it was not easy for them to let go of all the gods, all their Greek, old Greek belief to turn to the only God, the, the true, the living and true God. This decision, this change in the lives of these Greeks, these Greeks believers, was of uh, really sounded out. That is why in verse 5 I re we read, For our gospel not come to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of man we were among you for your sake, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, they received uh, the word in much affliction, certainly they, they found many opposition, many persecution from the Greeks. 
and so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. So the work of faith was so strong for those who were saved that it sounded out, sounded forth in many different places because they paid a very high price in the society they lived to serve God. In verse 3, you have to speak not only of the work of faith, we have the second is the labor, the better translation is labor of love, right? Love for God, for faith, we receive God's life, God's nature, and the essence of God, the nature of God is love. This love that makes us to love God, love the church of God, and to love our brothers and sisters, and care for one another, loving one another, and eventually... The patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were awaiting the Lord's coming as King to care for the earth for all people that would become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this hope, it is a fuel for us to endure in more, more difficult times. So this ground and still, just so you, for you to understand how all this region was raised with this Greek culture, they all spoke Greek, right, the Greek language, because Macedonia was part of Greece, but the Greece itself, the center of Greece, was in Athens. But in Athens, in the classic period, of the old Greece, Athens was the, the center city, all the culture, democracy came from there, but the dominion of Athens in the year 4, Philip II of Macedonia took over Greece. But still, Athens was still an important political center, a cultural center. And his son, when he died, Alexander Magnum the Great, he continued the conquest and he expanded the Macedonian Empire quickly. Approximately in 10 years, he conquered the whole region all the way to. India and Alexander the Great, the Great studied in Athens in a school founded by Aristotle and with the conquest of the Macedonian Empire he also took uh, the culture of Greece and the whole Greek language uh, to all the conquered land. He allowed the Greek culture with the Eastern culture, and eventually there was the Hellenists, which even the Eastern people would absorb the Greek culture, and this mixture became uh, the Hellenism, Hellenism. I believe that everyone today are studying English. And at that time, everyone wanted to learn to speak Greek because those who couldn't speak Greek were considered as barbarian. So everyone wanted to learn to speak Greek and to absorb the Greek culture. And this was the environment at the time, just for you to understand this context. Very good. So on verse 1 we read, let me repeat it. First, Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul, Silvanus, and Silas, right? And Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father. 
Only this first verse of the introduction already says that the Greeks who were saved turned to God. They did not uh, started a new religion. No. They what? What Paul presented was not a new religion that Paul is presenting. It was a, a organism, a living organism. God is the father of this organism, our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who connects God with the creature and grace and peace to you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not in a Christian religion as a religion. We are in a living organism. When we accept the word of the gospel, when we believe in Jesus, we confess his name and call on the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus, what happened was that we were saved by the Spirit of God and the life of God entered in us. We belong now to an organism. This organism is the church. This organism is the body of Christ. Therefore, it's not a religion, but it is a living organism. God placed us Today, thank God, we have our dynamic co-porters on the streets contacting people, praying for them on the streets. And this is doing what? We are taking this God, God's life to people, and also leaving books as the gospel of the kingdom in writing to these people. We want to reconnect those people with God through the gospel of the kingdom so that a larger number of people may come in this living organism. So, thank the Lord. Very good. Well, so, in First Thessalonians, I made a summary for us to better understand let me put it here, my summary in 14 items for us to better understand it, okay? First Thessalonians, it is divided in 14 main items. And for you to better understand, there are three prayers in the whole epistle, the first epistle, beginning with... Uh, Thanksgiving prayer, and then there is a second prayer, and it ends with a final prayer. So, the text in First Thessalonians, of the letter to the Thessalonians, uh, the first letter, it is set up in this way. First prayer, a middle prayer, and a prayer in the end. Very good. The first prayer, it is the Thanksgiving prayer in chapter 1, from verse 1 through 5. We all give thanks to God also for you and so on the gospel came to you not only in word so this is the first prayer a thanksgiving prayer because God really did great things through the gospel and the second great item is chapter 1 verses 6 through 10 which says the content that they abandoned a return to God from idols. This is a, sounded forth greatly, not just in Macedonia, but also in Achaia. Now, the third topic that I, I find very important, which is in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, because this portion here shows the labor of love of the apostles, that is, it shows, how I, would I say that, the sincerity, the pureness in their heart, with no deceit, with no second intentions. It was only to take the gospel of God to the Thessalonians in a simple, single way, in an honest way, presenting God to these people. So he says, I think it's important for us to go to read it quickly. Verse 2 
we, we see, let's go verse 2, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much of conflict. That is, they came from much conflict already in Philippi. In Philippi, you know, there's no for no reason they were put in jail and they were whipped and still they were arrested with no political reason. They were arrested and tied in a trunk in a high security cell but God provided salvation. Do you know the history in Philippi? Even if they were uh, spitefully treated, still they went to Thessalonica ready to be uh, mistreated again. What is the reason for that? Did they make anything for that? Did these apostles make any money like today? Any preachers make high amounts of money to preach the word? On the contrary, Paul did not make anything. He just received suffering and persecution. So here we read on verse 3, For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was, was it in deceit. There's no deceit in us. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. See, one thing is certain. We who serve God, we can deceive many with our eloquence, with our wisdom, with our knowledge, and with our eloquence, with our, our subtleness, craftiness, to conquer the hearts of those who, who hear us, who follow us, but we do not deceive God. If we have any deceit in our heart, any error or uncleanness, God will not approve that. This person, and God still cannot entrust him the word, cannot entrust the gospel. So to Paul, God knew his heart, God approved of him, and God entrusted him the gospel. This happens to us also. Don't think that we have a great number of followers, we have great popularity among people, like our preaching, but we want first to please God. We want to be faithful to God. We are not here to uh, raise voters on earth, reputation of followers. Uh, for neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, or a cloak for covetousness. We're not here to make money. Paul well, did not go to Thessalonica because of that uh, wealthy women of a high society with the goal of making money with covetousness. No. God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others. On the contrary, Paul cared for them in his labor of love, cared for them as a mother, caring for a newborn babe, uh, nursing with care and cherish even when she's tired and overwhelmed, she's there with her best for her child. This was Paul for those saints who were born in Christ and God. And also as a father with a fatigue, with labor, laboring day and night to proclaim the gospel of God to them. Verse 11. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you to his own kingdom and glory. This is the general subject in this semester. Very good. This is the third topic. But for me, it is one of the most important topics. We have the fourth topic not less important to just one verse. Second, first Thessalonians, sorry, chapter 2, verse 3. 
Verse 3 is already an item, which is the secret of the spiritual progress. If you want to make progress spiritually, want to grow spiritually, if you want to get to maturity, perfection, you need to learn this secret on verse 13. For verse 13, sorry. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, you heard from men, heard from the apostles, you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men. This is the word of God, as, as it, it is truth, the word of God, so which also effectively works in you who believe. Dear brothers and sisters, this is the secret of our spiritual progress. It's not knowing the Bible a lot, having a lot of the knowledge of the Word of God, but it is to know the channel through which God is speaking. And this word that comes out of God's channel that God entrusted, approved and entrusted we heard it as the word coming from God. We practice this word. This word itself will work in us. Okay? So in the Gospel of John, let us open it. In the Gospel of John, Lord Jesus. John chapter... 6, verse 28, we read, Then they said to him, What shall we do, the Jews, that we may work the works of God? That we are all worried about doing the works of God. We want to do the work of God, okay? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. If you believe, you know who was sent by God, what is the prophet that God is using? What is the prophet that God approved and entrusted him the prophetic word? And if you receive the word that comes from him as coming from God, then you will allow this word because of your faith. This word will operate effectively in you. So this is the spiritual progress, the secret of the spiritual progress, whether by church, whether by a region or individually, this is the secret of our spiritual progress. Dear brothers and sisters, this is a lesson that must last our whole life. And then we have next item, topic 5, which is chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, which speaks of the persecution of the Jews. The Jews not only persecuted them, but us also raised persecution from the Greeks themselves. But the Jews also persecuted the Church of God in Judea, and the Jews persecuted Jesus and killed Jesus. The Jews also persecuted Paul, did not allow him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles to save them. So the sin of the Jews, it is great. Yet, I said in one of those messages recently that still, God still loves Israel, God still reserved the end of times, seven years for them in their history, in the closing of this age. They will be taking part of the closing of this age. And we are waiting this moment. Uh, we are looking forward for this moment because I believe that we are so close to it. So topic six, it is the concern for their abrupt going out. First Thessalonians 2. From verse 17 through chapter 3, verse 10, which speaks that, like Paul said, Paul, he was very much worried with the church. The church in Thessalonica had, he had much expectation. It was a very promising church. Had everything for Paul to remain longer, to work well, to become a model in the church of a church. But Paul had to go out all of a sudden because of persecution, because of the uproar. Paul mourned, really mourned. He even tried to return some, 
couple times, but the Spirit did not allow him. So this is quite important for you to know this. Well, and then on topic 7, we begin the second prayer, Paul's prayer, chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, okay? This is a prayer, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. As he wants to return, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. This is the second prayer of Paul in the first letter. And on topic 8, chapter 4, from verses 1 through 8, which is what? The plea for holiness. Uh, among the Greeks there was much of a slewness, prostitution, was that large, even the religion itself allowed that. And this was not good. It was a goddess. Aphrodite. Was priests. Committing prostitution. But on behalf of this goddess. For the maintenance of the temple. So Paul. Exhorted them. If you want now, you are to serve the living and true God. Our God is uh, holy. Any sin outside of the body, uh, the body is outside of the body. But the fornication sin, prostitution, it is a sin against the body itself. So they needed to zeal for holiness, for purity, as for that. So on item 9, topic 9, is brotherly love. Uh, Exhortation to Brotherly Love, chapters 4, from verses 9 through 12. Okay. Because brotherly love, it is a fuel for the church life, for the labor of love. Without love, everything becomes, church life becomes something full of rules, full of, we can do this, we can't do that. This is not the church life. Okay, so we need to recover love among us, which is the new commandment. It is also the old commandment to love one another. And on topic 10, it is the hope of the coming of the Lord. This is in chapter 4, from verse 13 through 18. Because of the persecution, some were martyred, many were persecuted, suffered a lot. They were worried with these people who died. Uh, what happened to them? So Paul gave them a word to, uh, for them to be calm, that they're, they're not dead, they are sleeping. They will be raised at the coming of our Lord. In verse, item 11 is soberness. Uh, soberness and to be vigilant. We need to be watchful because we don't, we don't know when the Lord is coming. And if we want to meet the Lord in His secret coming, we need to be watchful. Uh, except that if we're not worried with that, in any way we'll be meeting the Lord in His public coming. But then we'll be missing out on the chance of becoming overcomers. Therefore, we are not of the night. We are of the day. We are sons of the day of light. We are not of the night or darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Okay? So, on item 12, chapter 5, verse 12 through 22, I, I put that as in how to watch. I have various items, various exhortations. So let me mention just a few of them, for example. Verse 16. Rejoice always. This is a way of watching. 
If I want to be always watchful, living in the Spirit, living the church life intensely, loving the saints, serving the saints, caring for one another, I can only have joy rejoicing always. This joy comes through donation. It's not just receiving. Oh, they visited me. That's nice. The saints love me. No. You love others. You have to give yourself to others. When you give yourself to others, when you preach the gospel, when you care for people, then you see that this joy is much greater than you're just receiving. That's why Paul said to the elders in Ephesus that it's better giving than receiving. We we'll rejoice always. As Christian saints, even during the pandemics and this isolation, although many are sad, many are, with, are without patience, but let us rejoice always. God can give us this joy. Pray without ceasing. We have to pray at all times. On the one hand, we need to set a time of prayer each day. Each day a time of prayer for ourselves, for our family, for the saints, for the work of the Lord, and so on. But we can also, saints, to live at, at all times that we are awake to be in fellowship with the Lord. We can be walking, headed up by God, that the Lord may be our guide, calling on His name, breathing His wonderful name. We can speak to God during the whole time. This is a way of watching. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. To give thanks, saints, it is salvation. You may be going through a situation that you cannot understand. You try to murmur and say, Lord, I don't know. I'm uh, very unfortunate. Stop murmuring. When you stop complaining, murmuring, and you thank God, say, Lord, I want to give you thanks even though I cannot understand. Why are you bringing these situations? I want to, to thank God. You know that thanking God uh, delivers you, sets you free. Uh, do not quench the spirit. Keep your spirit burning. Do not despise prophecies. Do not despise the prophetic word. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Do not keep on hearing many things. You need to know what is good. What is the direction of the Lord? What the Lord wants for you, okay? Do not be lost in this multitude of messages coming to you. Abstain from every form of evil. Okay, any appearance of evil, dear brothers and sisters, this is not good. You may say, I'm not doing anything wrong, but what others are seeing, appearance is important, okay? We got to final prayer, which is First Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved, blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. He will do it, the work that is lacking in you. Therefore, saints, this is Paul's prayer to finish this letter. In the end, only the greetings, which is item 14. The conclusion, which, with the greetings, uh, brethren, pray for us. It's important to pray for the apostles. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The word, you know, cannot stop among us. The, the prophetic word has to be spread out, has to be digested and passed on to all brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. I finish here with this tutorial. May the Lord reveal to you what He wants to speak to you. Okay? May God bless you. Amen.